We are thrilled to have all of you here at the National Constitution Center to cheer on our incredible high school student finalists who are seated here in the front row. The Harlan Institute Consource Virtual Supreme Court Competition offers teams of two high school students the opportunity to research cutting edge constitutional law, write persuasive appellate briefs, argue against other students through video chats, and try to persuade a panel of esteemed attorneys during our oral argument that their side is correct. This year's competition focuses on Fisher v. University of Texas at Austin II, exploring whether race-conscious affirmative action is consistent with the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The members of the grand prize winning team, the Solicitors General of the Virtual Supreme Court competition, will receive a free trip to Washington, D.C. to attend Consource's annual Constitution Day celebration. Members of the runner-up team will receive iPad minis, which is not a bad runner-up prize, I think. Josh is going to introduce our finalists and our panel of distinguished judges momentarily, but we would first like to thank a number of people who made today's championship round possible. First, I'd like to thank Josh Blackman from the Harlan Institute for co-sponsoring with Consource. Thank this, you, Julie. <laughs> this outstanding high school constitutional literacy contest for each of the last four years. It is, as always, an absolute joy to work with you and to see this competition grow and reach more outstanding high school students around the country each and every year. I'd also like to thank Jeff Rosen, Curry Sautner, Kate Maloney, and Bianca Cavassini from the National Constitution Center for arranging to host the championship round for our virtual Supreme Court competition here at the center as part of their second annual Freedom Day celebration. Uh, for those of you who are in the the audience, I recommend hanging around uh, for the evening panel discussions, which uh, will feature a number of really outstanding uh, judges and legal scholars. Uh, I cannot think of a more perfect venue for today's occasion, um, and I would also like to thank our student finalists who worked tirelessly to prepare for today's championship round, as well as our distinguished panel of judges who were so generous to volunteer their time today. Now I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Uh, to introduce our finalists and our judges. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My good friend and colleague, Julie Silverbrook, and I have run this competition for the last four years. This is the first time we've held this at the National Constitution Center across the street from Independence Hall. And by the way, happy birthday, Thomas Jefferson. Today is his birthday. And we are absolutely thrilled to be here as a testament to our Constitution and our rule of law. So I would like to now introduce our finalists and judges. So Kelsey Talbot and Lauren Anderson from Lake Oswego High School in Oregon will present the petitioners, Abigail Fisher. For respondents, Michael Morales and Tanya Reyes, I'm sorry, Tanya Reyna from IdeaQuest College Prep in Edinburgh, Texas, represent the University of Texas. Each team will receive 15 minutes for arguments and each team will have five minutes for rebuttal. After arguments, the judges, we will deliberate, and we will announce a winner on the stage. So now, as is customary, when the judges arrive, we all stand. Oye, 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 the honorable judges of the virtual Supreme Court are now in session. Please rise. Our chief justice today is the honorable Theodore McKee, who is indeed the chief judge of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals right here in Philadelphia. Please, a round of applause for Judge McKee. The associate justices of the virtual Supreme Court, which is indeed no longer virtual, we have a real one now, are Professor Kermit Roosevelt, a professor of constitutional law at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. <laughs> Mr. Howard Bashman, blogger and presario, an appellate attorney, and the founder of the How Appealing blog from also Philadelphia. And we have two treats. We have two students, Matthew Roan from Franklin and Marshall College. He is a debate champion, as is Miriam Peterson from Swarthmore College. She is also a debate champion. And Julie will be an associate justice, and I will be sitting <laughs> in the seat next to the chief so I can keep time as a judge as well. We thank you all, and we ask petitioners, if you will please approach the podium. Thank you so much.
May it please the court that I, Kelsey Talbot, and my partner Lauren Anderson represent the appellant, Ms. Abigail Fisher, in her case against the University of Texas at Austin. The question presented before the court today is if race-conscious affirmative action is consistent with the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The facts of the case are as follows. Ms. Fisher was denied admission to the University of Texas at Austin in 2008 due to the racially discriminatory affirmative action policy set in place at the university in 2004. Affirmative action is the preferential treatment regarding college admissions for those of a minority race. Affirmative action must be evaluated under the strict scrutiny standard. In order to pass this standard, a program must be narrowly tailored and have a compelling state interest. After reviewing the facts of the case, we conclude that race-conscious affirmative action is not consistent with the United States Constitution 14th Amendment. In Hopwood v. Texas, the 5th District ruled that, quote, the University of Texas School of Law may not use race as a factor in deciding which applicants to admit in order to achieve a diverse... Are you saying that diversity is not a compelling interest and you should rethink that? No, diversity is a compelling state interest as seen in Bakke. What about this case is different from the race plus rule that we said was okay, the Justice Powell said was okay in Bakke? Why isn't this the same thing, race plus? Um, it's much different from Bakke because we do acknowledge that they have compelling state interest, which is diversity, but what we're trying to say is that they do not meet the requirements for narrowly tailored. So what, what should they be doing other than their actual program? It is actually not our burden to bear. The burden of proving that the program is narrowly tailored is UT's burden to bear. But um, if... Well, you said it did not meet the Constitution. So you're saying, you're arguing that it does not comply with the constitutional restrictions, but yet it's not your burden to back that statement up. Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry, I couldn't really hear you. Yes, you said it did not comply. The Texas program was unconstitutional. But now you're saying that it's not your burden to show why it's not constitutional. You're saying it's inconsistent with the no, protection, um, but you don't have to show why. Actually, we are saying that it is not our burden to tell UT how to narrowly tailor their program. Well, the question you asked was, what are they doing? What could they be doing to it more narrowly tailored? You're saying that this is not narrowly tailored, mm -hmm. sufficiently narrow. And, and you were asked by my colleague, how could they make it more narrow? And if you can't answer that, then maybe they, this is the narrowest possible tailoring, which would be okay under Grutter. It is not. This is not a critical mass. They have not stated anything of the, that, um, that such. And we have um, different ideas for, the tech, uh, for University of Texas, but we are not in the spot to tell them which route to take. Um, we are here to say that their uh, system right now is not narrowly tailored and so they are violating the law. you don't want to answer my colleague's question, Justice Roosevelt's question, that's what you're saying? We can answer your question. It is just not our burden. We, we understand that, but why don't you give us some examples of how this could be more narrowly tailored? Of course. Um, there, are other, uh, uh, there are other systems such as low income, uh, single family, class based, there's also been a recent um, study done at the University of Colorado at Boulder, which uses a two-part system that um, it's... They have two indices. Uh, one is a disadvantage index, and the other is an overachievement index. Um, in 2008, uh, there was a ballot measure that threatened to ban affirmative action. So the admissions officers at CU uh, set out to um, construct another program that would uh, maintain minority representation. Um, but they also, uh, this program, um, it increases uh, low income representation and could even predict uh, success in college. And the CU Boulder, they did two studies. Uh, the first one was in 2009. They reviewed uh, 478 applicants, uh, one under the race-based policy that they were currently using, and another, uh, this second half of them were um, reviewed under the new income-based uh, policy. Um, and their results were that there was a, um, there was, what is it, a 9% increase in underrepresented minorities using the income-based policy and a 20% increase in very low but why socioeconomic. Why should we defer to the university in terms of how the university wants to run its educational program? Why should the court step into deciding for an education what's the best educational policy for it to pursue? Um, I think the biggest parallel between this case and 
Well, that we can see uh, par in Parents v. Seattle, um, the school said that their goal was diversity. Um, it there was a quota there, wasn't there? What? Wasn't that a quota system? No, that was actually uh, racial balancing. Mm -hmm. um, but they used a numerical system to balance, and it could work in favor of the whites or in favor of the blacks. And yes, the but the... It was never deemed a quota system in the courts. It was always seen as racial balancing, and so we can't really compare it to a quota system right now. But the point to be made is that we cannot trust a school to say what their goal is when they could actually have a hidden goal in mind. So, Counselor, um, can you talk a little bit about the top 10 percent plan, which is mm -hmm. particular to Texas, and whether you think that may be a least restrictive means uh, by which uh, uh, the compelling interest diversity can be achieved? Uh, well, the top 10 percent rule was sta uh, created after Hopwood v. Texas. Um, and so basically what the top 10 percent rule does is it takes the top 10 percent from any uh, high school in Texas and it uh, automatically gives them, uh, gives them admittance to any Texas public school. Um, and so what it's doing right now is it's allowing for the uh, students who are of minority race who um, are at the academic level, which they should be to get uh, into these um, universities is allowing them to get into. And it's creating a much more diverse student body. And, and do you think the top 10 percent plan is consistent with the 14th Amendment? Yes, we do think that the top 10 percent plan is consistent with the 14th Amendment because it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't take race into account. And it doesn't categorize people or disadvantage or advantage them based solely on their race. It's very meritocratic. What happens if in the school's mind the diversity which you conceded was a compelling state interest is not sufficiently achieved by using the top 10 percent, then what does the school do? Um, if they don't see that the top 10 percent rule doesn't give them a uh, diverse enough student body, then they should use a system, as we stated before, that has been deemed constitutional, uh, such as critical mass, such as uh, low income based or class based. So they, but, can't, they can't devise a system that in their own minds is more appropriate for their own demographic groupings? They can, but the problem with UT is that it's not narrowly tailored. So su suppose that nothing else works. There's no other system that would generate the diversity that the school is looking for. Are they permitted to use an explicit racial classification under any circumstances if it's the only thing that will work? No. We're just saying um, that it has to be narrowly tailored. Their system has to be the only way that they can go about it. They cannot use a quota. They cannot grant uh, given points just for a certain race. Can, can I just ask a hypothetical question? Say you have two students who's objective criteria are identical and, and one is the member of a minority group and the other is is not and after the 10 percent top 10 percent students have been brought in you can see that that minority group is underrepresented can they take the students membership in the minority group into account to break the tie or do they have to flip a coin at that point um, I think it depends. Uh, they have to look through a holistic process. Uh, they have to take into PAI scores, AI scores. They have to look at many different things. And if it comes down to, you know, one factor of race, then it really shouldn't come down to that. Um, well, what it, happens if it does? In the hypothetical, it does. That's what you frame the hypothetical. Mm -hmm. If it does, then they would have to choose the best applicant. Um, how Under you, their process right now at UT, if they take, they take race as a decisive factor. How do you define best and best for whom? Best in terms of the school's demographics, best in terms of likelihood to succeed in the university, however the university deems that. How do you define mm -hmm. who's best and what do you mean by best, best applicant? If the school is trying to uh, obtain a representative population on their campus of the Texas population, then they should choose whoever will be a good representative of the minority or whatever race that student is of. But right now, the Texas University of Texas, who is trying, who has attempted to create a representative campus, is not. They, what, what you're saying is they should then select it based upon race, not the other kinds of demographics which you put forward in an earlier answer. You're saying in that context, it's OK for them to for select based only upon race and the extent to which that allows them to achieve the, per, the the compelling interest of diversity. Income and all those other things are not necessarily to, to be calculated. No, saying. you were saying the hypothetical situation that was brought up was two uh, students that were identical. Did you mean in only academics or in all facets? That wasn't my hypothetical. All facets. Oh. <laughs> all facets. So that means they have the same extracurriculars. They have uh, the same 
amounts of uh, volunteer hours. So that means they have diverse um, qualifications for the school, and it just means that race might add a little more diversity. Councilor, if I can follow up on the question from the chief, isn't this a matter not for the courts? I mean, you're getting to really granular questions over admissions mm -hmm. policies. We really want federal judges supervising how schools um, do this. I mean, what, what weight of deference is owed to the school's judgment of how to structure their admissions criteria? How much deference do we owe the schools? And maybe if you can address Fisher 1, which this court decided a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that the court should not have to bear the burden of determining the, which. The, the, the plaintiff, not, not the court. Or, or the court should not bear the burden. Yes, that's what you stated. Um, so we don't believe that we should determine who gets in. We don't believe who the court, we don't believe the court should determine. We believe it's the burden of deciding admissions policies and making sure that they are narrowly tailored and have a compelling state interest lays on the plaintiff. You said narrowly tailored several times, but it sounds like you're not talking about narrowly tailoring. This is narrowly tailoring. You're so, it sounds like you're advocating for the most narrow possible system, the narrowest, as opposed to a narrow system, you want the narrowest system. Is that what you're arguing for? If there's any way that something could be done which is more narrow, narrow telling is not sufficient. And we've never said that, have we? It's got, have we ever said it's got to be the narrowest possible system, the least uh, alternative as opposed to just a narrow system? Well, narrowly tailored by definition is the, there's no other way to do it. So that means the, the most narrow option. But you put most in there. We've never put most in there. We said it simply has to be narrowly tailored. You're proposing that we adopt a new test. You're saying the most narrowly tailored as opposed to simply narrowly tailor, tailoring. In other words, Councilor, if I can elaborate on the Chief's question, what if we identify that maybe this might not be the best, right? This is not the most narrow. But this exists as a pretty good, right? It's a pretty good fit between the state's interest in diversity and the approach you're using. Shouldn't that not be enough to um, affirm the judgment of the lower court and rule for the University of Texas if it's a pretty good fit? I mean, it might not be perfect in your minds, but you know, it, it works and it achieves that interest well. The admission policy at UT is not narrowly tailored. It uses a quota system and there- um, how, how, does, how does the UT system impose a quota in its current manifestation? Um, in their proposal to consider race and ethnicity for admissions, they quote, that they want student diversity in each classroom to be two African American students, two Hispanic students, and two Asian American students in each classroom. This amounts to a quota system. No matter what you say, it's based on numbers, and they need two of each in each classroom. This I, is I a read, quota system. I read that in your brief, but isn't it? Uh, that doesn't who's in the classroom depend upon what classes the students sign up for? I mean, this is only deciding who gets in the door, not who's going to be in a specific class taking intro to sociology, does it? Well, no matter how UT turns it, that policy is unattainable too. Because if they were saying that they want two of each minority in each classroom, in where every that, single where class. Where does that figure come from, this, this two of each? That's, that's an official statement they made? Yes, in their, their proposal to consider uh, race and ethnicity in admissions. Hmm. In, in whose proposal? UT's. Which, it, is, which is where? It was stated um, in Fisher v. Texas 1. So you guys would say that a critical mass system, as in a system that aims at having a critical mass of students within a classroom so that people of diverse backgrounds can have other people from their background to work with, is an unconstitutional system inherently? No. Critical mass is constitutional. Okay. So what is like actually saying what number of students need to be in each classroom other than a critical mass system? How is it distinct? A critical mass, uh, as stated in Grutter, is so that a minority student won't feel isolated in their environment. Um, but when you put in a quota system and you're saying that there needs to be two African American students in this classroom, well, that student may feel that they're just there so they can fulfill this quota that the university needs. Maybe they don't actually really want that student there. They'll feel... Given, given that the framers of the 14th Amendment set up programs such as Freeman's Bureaus which used quota systems, why should we assume that a quota system would not be in line with the intention of the framers of the 14th Amendment, or why should we reject their original intent? Well, the quota system has deemed, been deemed unconstitutional in Baki. I think there's no other question. 
regarding that. Um, the court has already said that it's unconstitutional. Okay, but we, we are the Supreme Counselor, Court. You have 17 seconds left. I, I apologize, but oh. uh, if you want to finish Justice Roosevelt's question. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, we are the Supreme Court. We could overrule prior decisions. So I, I would like to hear something about how you think the approach that you're advocating for squares with the original purpose and understanding of the 14th Amendment. Uh, we understand the original intent of the 14th Amendment to be remedial effects for the specific victims of slavery. The Freedmen's Bureau was very narrow in their, um, in, in their approaches, and it was mostly for education. Um, but since then, the 14th Amendment has been expanded under strict scrutiny to protect um, uh, religion and alienage under intermediate to protect gender and under the lowest burden to protect uh, things such as sexual orientation and Oberfell. Thank you. Uh, we're going to give respondents 15 minutes. You will have five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. going to begin now. Justices of this court, before addressing anything else, I'd like to discuss an eminent case of the 90s, Hopwood versus Texas. Prior to 1996, the University of Texas at Austin employed an admissions policy that considered the applicant's race directly, ultimately making it a decisive factor. This ceased to exist by 1996 when a federal court declared UT's consideration of race unconstitutional. In just two years, UT's admissions process faced an intractable problem as it became an overly white enterprise, with a sharp decline in African American and Hispanic enrollment despite an increasing growth in both populations. In an effort to promote critical mass and represent state demographics, which has long provided the baseline for UT's consideration of race, UT employed the top 10% Texas law HB 588. These race-neutral initiatives came at a cost to educational objectives and diversity as minority enrollment remains stagnant or worsen in the years to come. Consequently, in 2005, UT began evaluating student applications on the current admissions process, an academic index, personal achievement index, AI, PAI score. This holistic system of scoring branches off into two sections. The academic index, which is comprised of grade point average and standardized test scores, and the Personal Achievement Index score, which is an amalgam of two essays and a Personal Achievement score. This Personal Achievement score is based on six equally weighed factors, one of these being special circumstances. This special circumstances factor is then broken down into seven more factors, including socioeconomic status, single parent home, language spoken at home, family responsibility, socioeconomic status of school attendant, average SAT, ACT of school attendant in relation to students' own SAT, ACT, and lastly, race. At the moment, race is weighted equally with six other factors, but in any case, the question still stands. Is UT allowed to implement race as a part of the holistic approach? In answering this question, I'd like to provide UT's definition of diversity, which is a composite of the backgrounds, experiences, achievements, and hardships of students to which race only contributes. As Justice Powell found Harvard's uh, admissions program to be particularly commendable for its use of race as an aspect weighted against qualities such as exceptional personal talents, leadership potential, demonstrated compassion, and a history of overcoming disadvantage and an ability to communicate with the poor, the University of Texas at Austin is nearly indistinguishable from this tier one school. This broad array of qualifications. I'm not yes. sure I understand. And let me start with the, uh, the, the uh, critical mass. Where does the concept of critical mass come from? And doesn't that suggest the necessity of a quota, however loosely you define it? How can you argue that a compelling mass, that a, uh, a critical mass is necessary to achieving your goal, that it's constitutional? 
and that also it does not involve a quota. Why, wouldn't, why shouldn't we just strike it down based upon that? In Grutter, they actually defined critical mass for us um, by reference to a broader view of diversity rather than by the achievement of a certain quota of minority students. The why, why is the ISD of a critical mass even constitutional? Doesn't that suggest a quota system is at work? It does not suggest a quota system. The concept of the critical mass is basically giving the opportunity for minority students, in this case, to have an equal playing field compared to students from more affluent communities who are more established in their hometowns. But you do, is is that ahead. what the diversity rationale is about? Because it, it sounds to me now like you're saying maybe you want to take race into account to make up for past discrimination or, or hardship. No, that's, it's actually what we really wanted to point out was that you, the University of Texas at Austin uses race in a very special way. So they're not giving a point to a student simply because they're a minority, an ethnic minority. They, the way they use race is they look at race in the context in which a student was brought up. So in this case, if a white student was raised in a African-American neighborhood or in a school populated uh, with a, a student body that was overwhelmingly African-American, then they will give the student a point for crossing that racial barrier and showing that they can achieve uh, despite being a minority in their school. They're not giving So could, could you tell me what the point of diversity is? Well, um, diversity in the student body produces a degree of intra-classroom and intra-majority diversity with the important and uh, with an important benefit recognized in Grutter of classroom discussion being livelier, more spirited, and simply more interesting when the students have the greatest possible variety of backgrounds. Counselor, if I may, um, when will we know if we've hit a critical mass? Okay, how will we, I'm sorry, how will we know if we hit a critical mass? So uh, from the research that we've done, the, the question itself is very intricate and there's not a set answer. So you, it's basically, we know that we have a critical mass. You know, we have a concept of students not feeling marginalized in their schools. And at the same time, we can't have that quota system. We can't have numbers representing these you students. You and, know you have a critical no, mass? Excuse me? You're saying you know you do have a critical mass? No, uh, we're saying concept. that we, uh, the critical mass exists, the concept exists, and it's something that all universities um, should strive for in their undergrad admissions because Why? that, well, as UT put in the initial case, um, the attainment of a diverse student body serves values beyond race alone, including enhanced classroom dialogue and the lessening, lessening of racial isolation and stereotype. This in turn provides an atmosphere which is most conducive to speculation, experiment, and creation. Let me just boil the question down mm -hmm. um, and, and really uh, get it at the heart of what we're asking. How do you, if you are going to say there is a critical mass, doesn't that really come down to a certain number of racially diverse students? How else are you measuring it? I mean, you have a sizable student population, mm -hmm. right? So you're talking about very amorphous concepts. Uh, how are you going to measure a critical mass if not looking at numbers, which sounds a lot like a quota? Well, the way that we, the University of Texas is looking at this critical mass is, again, making sure that students on campus do not feel marginalized. So in terms of the population of UT itself, critical mass, I know it sounds, um, it's kind of a far reach, but critical mass itself is never going to be um, achieved all on its own without supplement. But critical why, mass. Why should the Constitution be concerned with the feelings of students on campus? Why should the Constitution take cognizance of the fact that some students might be marginalized, some students might not feel marginalized? And taking cognizance of that in terms of race, why isn't that smack dab in the middle of, the, of a violation of the equal protection? This, it's not so much about making sure that students feel better about themselves on campus. Uh, we've seen that marginalization of students on campus actually produces, produces problems with students. So it's, uh, they're less likely to become successful in their academic career, it's, uh, especially if they feel singled out on campus or if they what feel if, they're the token. Uh, what if there are students who feel uncomfortable because of the presence of racial minorities? Would this rationale allow you to exclude them? Uh, can you rephrase your question? Well, so you're, you're talking about the experience that students have and their success and their contribution to the classroom discourse. 
um, and that they, it's, it's bad if they feel marginalized or uncomfortable or made to serve as tokens or representatives. And I'm just wondering if you could run that argument in the other direction and say, here's a school where what makes the students feel uncomfortable is the presence of racial minorities. Could this rationale then be used to exclude them? That would, that would lead in turn to segregated schools. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what this is fighting against. You know? Right, but if, for example, if you read Justice Thomas's dissent, um, in the in the first Fisher case, um, uh, he's not with us today. But but if if, if he were, um, he explained that the rationales in favor of affirmative action by considering race explicitly are the same arguments made by the segregationists. Indeed, when schools were segregated in the 1950s, they said to avoid racial conflict and avoid making people people uncomfortable, we need to keep everyone separated, right? So we need to consider race and keep people apart. I think Justice Roosevelt's question speaks that issue. I mean, so the same rationale of making people feel upset could perhaps cut both ways. If we can use race for this way, we can use race for that way. Um, certainly, uh, that could be, that might seem plausible, but at the end of the day, when we're looking at what diversity does to the campus, you know when these students leave this university, they're going to be exposed to a world where, you know, our country itself is a melting pot. When you go out of college and you go get a degree and you're going to go get a job, you're not going to find yourself uh, in a town where it's all, for example, white people. You know, like our country has a ton of people here, and if the Have university you ever been to the middle of Pennsylvania? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, you're making a statement which assumes something which I'm not sure the facts would support. Well, it, it's, or, um, it's, um, it's circumstantial, of course. But in, in reality, a person is never going to find themselves completely isolated from a world where there's an African American next door or an, uh, Native American down the street. How do you, how do you answer the stigma that is sometimes viewed as attached to affirmative action? That, that the only reason people are here is, is that they were given a, uh, a leg up that they didn't deserve and the people who did deserve to be there instead didn't, didn't make it. And, uh, and that may or may not be true. I mean, we, we're, in a, we're in a country today where the president is African American, where, where uh, you know, African Americans are represented throughout the highest levels of, of government. And yet, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, the only reason that person made it instead of somebody else was because, uh, you know, they were given a spot that they didn't otherwise deserve. How, how do we deal with that stigma, whether it's true or not? The admissions committee isn't inclined to give a certain applicant a point simply because they're this race. They, uh, um, the application committee looks at what barriers that specific applicant has um, I'm sorry, uh, achieved, achieved uh, but despite. The, the, but the initial inquiry is, is definitely focused in terms of race, isn't it? absent the racial equation, you wouldn't even be making the inquiry. So doesn't that get back to the same problem? Well, when the application is be uh, being viewed besides the top 10% plan, these are the students that get reviewed holistically. They're not going to give us a, uh, a student that was an African American who was raised in a white neighborhood. That student will get a point, you know, for crossing that racial barrier. But by looking at the application, the university is not going to compare this student to another student uh, for example, who didn't have to cross that racial barrier and who had uh, exceedingly high uh, academic qualifications. The fact that these students are even being viewed um, in this holistic approach means that they are already qualified to be in the university. And at this point, it's more of a matter of showing that this student has leadership and other uh, attractable qualities that will really uh, produce a viable, so, so, so strong counselor, student body. Can you respond to your friend's arguments about this Colorado study that looked at this index of achievement and index of, uh, of various characteristics? I mean, may, maybe that's at least restrict. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> A more narrowly tailored—I I, did her miss. I said what she said. Maybe it's a more narrowly tailored approach to accomplishing this this compelling interest diversity. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'm not really uh, taking note on what they were saying. I'm not really sure how they uh, defined that process in Colorado. But from what I perceived was that if we're going to give students a point simply because they uh, were raised in a circumstance where they uh, had a poor socioeconomic status, then this is eventually going to culture segregated school districts where you're going to have poor students compared to white students. So it, Excuse it, me, not white students, uh, more affluent students. It would bad. seem that affirmative action 
only has any efficacy if it gets some students into a university who otherwise would not have gotten in. Why do you believe the interests of diversity are better served by a larger number of less qualified students rather than a smaller number of more qualified minority students? These applicants are qualified in other um, manners, not solely their GPA or standardized test scores, but in their leadership potential and their ability to communicate with others. There is a broad array of characteristics that can be looked at to determine whether or not an applicant is highly qualified or not. Could we, could we focus just for a second on, on the actual words of the Constitution? Yes. And, and could you tell me what you think equal protection of the laws means and how explicit consideration of race could be consistent with that? Well, the way that we chose to define, uh, well, in this case, uh, no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So when we're applying these laws, and of course, the Constitution itself is malleable. I think, personally, um, that it sort of molds to the current day and the circumstances that we we're face. We're more interested in what the law requires than your personal views on the matter. Hmm? We're really more interested in what the law requires than your personal views. And, and, and now, Justice Scalia, the Constitution is dead. It's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not. Uh, it's more than just my personal opinion. Of course, the equal, uh, the way we chose to define it is, if the a law is going to be applied equally to all students, then you really have to look at all the other, um, all the other type of um, application processes that distinguish a person on different factors. So if we're going to apply law equally, this uh, using race as a factor is applied equally to all the students because at well, But it's not because you have the top 10 percent, everybody gets evaluated the same. Yes. But then if that doesn't get you where you want to be, you have the separate admissions process where race comes into the door. Why shouldn't we simply decide that you can use the top 10 percent program, that gets some diversity, that achieves the compelling interest of even your opponents exist as uh, conceded as okay under the Equal Protection Clause, but that's it. After that, this whole critical mass concept, that that gets us too far down the slippery slope of a racial preference and that we're not going to allow that. Why shouldn't we hold that? And your time's about to expire, but you can answer Chief Justice's question. When the mechanical admissions program of the top 10 percent plan was first implemented on the incoming freshmen of the class of 1997, um, it looked at one factor, and that was class rank. It didn't consider their leadership potential. It didn't consider any other factors, solely their class rank. It didn't even consider standardized test scores. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead and step down. You have five minutes for rebuttal. And petitioners, you can come back up uh, for your five-minute rebuttal. started with five minutes of rebuttal. We would just like to reiterate that Abigail Fisher was um, considered under admissions categorically. She was automatically ineligible for certain categories and she was disadvantaged or, dis or advantaged solely on the basis of race. And because she was ineligible, because this is a question of race, it has to be evaluated under the strict scrutiny standard, and it must be narrowly can, can tailored. Can you tell me what equal protection of the laws means and, and how that gets you to the idea that all racial classifications should receive strict scrutiny? Um, equal protection under the law is just that the law is applied to all persons, regardless of race, religion, alienage, um, equally the same. Um, and then how this gets us to... Well, is it, is it your position that the equal protection clause means no racial classifications? Because then I'm wondering why the drafters didn't just write that. It doesn't mean no racial classifications. It just means that racial classifications are considered equally, equally important as other factors, as uh, stated in Grutter, one of many factors, not the decisive factor. Well, but any factor could be decisive in some particular case. I mean, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time on this, but um, maybe you could say something about the, the practice of the Reconstruction Congress. Because um, it does seem to me when the Equal Protection Clause was ratified, there were lots of racial classifications, right? Not just 
the Freedmen's Bureau, but uh, segregated schools, bans on interracial marriage. So it doesn't seem that the people who drafted and ratified the Equal Protection Clause thought that all racial classifications were going to be swept away. Yes. Um, so we would like to say that the Equal Protection Clause, it has been transformed into something even in the eight, uh, 19th century. Uh, the case of Yick Woo v. Hopkins in 1886, it allowed for um, a, an Ill, a, um, illegal um, uh, alien who um, traveled to China and then wanted to come back to the U.S. It granted him citizenship, uh, it didn't grant him citizenship, it, it allowed him to um, have, equal, have equal protection. Yeah have the rights of the 14th Amendment because it protects aliens. So even but to answer your question, um, the founders at the time that they ratified the 14th Amendment, there were so many racial classifications and they didn't think it would go away, but they sought to uh, the goal of an, a just and equitable society no matter your race. So, Counsel, your friend on the other side said the Constitution is malleable, and I stopped that it's dead. Um, if indeed the Constitution is dead, and as, as Justice Roosevelt said, there were racial classifications in 1868, how does that inform our inquiry? I mean, how can, how can a segregated school in 1868 suddenly become unconstitutional in 1955 with Brown? How could racial classifications with the Fre Freedmen's Bureau Act now become unconstitutional with UT's policy? I mean, where, where is this give? Where is this constitutional evolution? Is it is Justice Scalia wrong? Is it is it alive? Is it is it well? Is it is it, is it trans, uh, tra trans transubstantiating? I don't even know what word you use. <laughs> Transforming. <laughs> yeah, it's a transcendental <laughs> dimensions of liberty. I mean, t tell us. Well, even if the Constitution is dead, um, <laughs> where's Jeff Rose? He's going to be mad at us. <laughs> um, there's still it's a social implications in. Uh, the 1800s, um, there was different social uh, implications because of your race. Um, the language of the Fourth Amendment has not changed. The language is the same. That goes back to Justice Roosevelt's initial question, equal protection, what does it mean? I'm sorry, can you restate the question? You're talking about um, the transformation of the, the Constitution and the different social attitudes at the time of the Freedmen's Bureau, but I'm saying the language of the 14th Amendment remains the same. Mm -hmm. And the question I think we're all wrestling with right now is what is equal protection in the context of your argument? That was what Professor or Justice Roosevelt was asking you. What does equal protection mean? Equal protection um, is the pro equal protection of every American citizen under American law, uh, no matter based on race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, they are protected equally under the laws of every other citizen. That is what it means in the context of this case, uh, specifically dealing with race. And the words to the Constitution may be the same, but the way that the courts have chosen to interpret them have changed over time. Your time is up. Thank you very much. And Thank you. And we will uh, ask the respondents to come back to the podium for fi their five minutes of rebuttal time. So really why we're here today is to understand and interpret as to whether the University of Texas at Austin can use race the way that it's using race in its admissions process. Is it constitutional for them to use race in this holistic approach? And in order to do this, we need to look at strict scrutiny. And of course, strict scrutiny, uh, the, they have to comply Your with- Your statement kind of assumes the fact that you said we're here to determine whether or not it's constitutional to use race in this holistic approach. We have not decided whether or not the holistic approach itself is constitutional. You're starting with a given up, you've got the holistic approach, it's okay. It's a constitutional to use race within that approach. But why should we assume that the holistic approach is the way you're using it, uh, past the 10% plan? Why should we assume that that's okay? 
Excuse me. Um, if anything, I could rephrase and state that really we're here to see whether race conscious affirmative action is um, constitutional under the 14th Amendment. So when we're looking at that, we need to look at strict scrutiny and how the University of Texas um, complies with these standards. So first off, um, in reference to what was stated earlier, the the two African Americans, two Native Americans uh, in the classroom, that was in the uh, initial uh, UT versus Fisher one, and it was it's it's taken out of context because really when UT the University of Texas was stating this, they were using these numbers to give to the judges an idea as to how diversity is in their campus because oh, diversity it, itself is tied to race. Race ties into diversity uh, one way or another and by giving this demonstration of how many students were in the actual classroom they could give an idea to the judges as to okay this is what the University of Texas has right now and we want to improve this. If this was a quota system, uh, yes your honor? But, but th that sounds an awful lot like a quota that says okay when we have this many we'll be good right so let, let's leave this policy in place so we get this two two whatever it is. Well if this was a quota system then the University of Texas would have stopped right after the two 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 numbers. Have they already the achieved this two 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 or is that an aspiration is that a goal? It's not so much an aspiration because really you're never going to have one classroom that's going to have all minorities. It, it, it depends it fluctuates the classrooms change and you're you're not going to uh, the university can't um, accredit this criterion just could, by simply could, could looking at... Could a public at, university assign students into classes based on race? I don't think so, no. So actually the UC Berkeley Law School is actually <laughs> doing just that. They create a special minority section where all the <laughs> students in the section are, are African American. The reason why is they want people to feel tokenism. They want to feel together. Would such a policy do you think be constitutional? I do not... We do not think so, no, because when... You, at the end of the day, that's going to create a segregated school system. You're oh, but they've argued the opposite, that it makes the minorities feel at ease. They don't have to worry about uh, acknowledging racial tension. They can, they can learn in a more natural environment. They, they actually favor it. The La, La Raza and various student groups actually are in favor of this sort of uh, uh, assignment. And a I respond with a majority of ethnic minorities, especially in Texas, really agree with what UT is doing. Uh, but that does not mean that it is constitutional. And we are arguing that it is. So um, the second standard that it must meet besides the quota system that it does not have is whether this will, uh, this is narrowly tailored, whether it will achieve the goal or not. And by including race in their holistic approach, the way they're using race, in reality it can benefit students from all backgrounds. I could be a white student in an African American neighborhood and I will benefit from this process. How does that help you get to the critical mass? Well the critical mass, as we stated before, it, it's conceptual. Really, it's, it's making sure that uh, the university is getting that diversity that it seeks because diversity in itself supplements the classroom. It helps students become... But if you're, the example you gave of a white person from a black, predominantly black neighborhood and selecting that person under the holistic approach does not help you achieve the critical mass that allows blacks or Latinos on the campus to feel more welcomed or more comfortable. That begs the question of what happens on the flip side of that is Professor Roosevelt was asking about the white students who might be feeling less comfortable because of that presence. But how does, how does that, that selection of that white student help you get to the critical mass? And if it doesn't, does that create a problem under the, the equal protection test? Well, no, because even though you, do, you are going to have white students who benefit from this process, especially in school districts, you're going to have a lot of minorities who benefit from this process. What happens if only white students benefit from the process? You well, then the process? that's where we change the system. That's where we uh, try because to Because the numbers are not different. working for you, right? You change the system because the numbers are not working, right? Well, no, don't, because don't the mass. we're going to change it because students on campus as a majority feel that the, uh, the university is not representing the state demographics that the University of Texas at Austin was striving to achieve beforehand. Thank you. Uh, your time is up. Uh, now the justices are going to uh, go back stage and deliberate, and then in a couple of minutes we will announce our champions and second place finalists from the stage. So just go ahead and hang out in the audience while we do that. If you want to read the Constitution, the 14th Amendment is very long. It takes much time to read the 14th Amendment as well as to deliberate. Make sure you have all the way to Section 5. It's all in there. Yeah. Don't stop with section one. The other stuff is good stuff too. Oh, no need to rise again, but thank you uh, for the decorum. We just have.
We're bringing the judges back to the stage uh, for announcing uh, the winners. We want to say uh, to you, uh, both teams and their teachers and families just how impressed we were uh, with these two teams of, of high school uh, seniors who I uh, traveled just yesterday to participate in this competition um, in front of uh, a really hot panel of judges who asked a lot of, of questions. Um, and it, it took us quite a bit of time to make a decision, um, but we have made a decision and we are very pleased to announce that the Harlan Institute Consorts Virtual Supreme Court 2016 uh, national champions are Tanya and Michael from Idea Quest College Preparatory. Why don't you? Uh, that's their teacher, by the way. That's their teacher. If you please come up, we have these beautiful plaques uh, for you. And our second place finalists, by the way, we also have prizes for you and you should be very proud of your accomplishments. This was a very difficult choice for the judges and we're going to do a little photo op here uh, with Michael and Tanya. And why don't we come around uh, here so they, here come stand, oh thank you so much, congratulations. Careful the, the panels, but let's come in front of the congratulations. judges and congratulations, winners, sir. congratulations. Come on out to the, in front of the table so we can get uh, some nice pictures here. Um, and then Kelsey and Lauren, we're going to have you come up and do the same photo op. Sorry. This was a really close decision and we were very evenly divided. If you saw the score, you wouldn't believe how close it was. So we welcome both of you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Garrett, please come up as well. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And these are for you because you are both you. wonderful you. advocates and should celebrate. And so we'll just do a, a quick. Yes, and they get their iPad and they use it. And you get an iPad? <laughs> <laughs> 